compartilhar minha tela. Eu vou dar uma aula básica sobre anatomia. Meu nome é Luciano Gregório, eu sou professor afiliado da Escola Política de Medicina. Eu participo do setor de rinologia, do departamento de otorrinolaringologia e cirurgia de cabeça e pescoço. E a gente está fazendo esse rino especial com o convidado do ben, Dr. Benjamin Blair, lá da Harper Medical School. E uh, eu vou dar uma introdução básica sobre a anatomia de órbita para a aula dele ficar um pouco mais confortável para todo mundo. Tá? Vamos lá. Perfeito. Um, bom, uh, para começar, eu gostaria de uh, apresentar a anatomia básica, que eu acho que é sempre importante para nós cirurgiões. Então, a gente tem sete, or sete ossos que compõem a órbita, e separando eles, a gente consegue identificar osso por osso, e aí, entre eles, a gente consegue identificar as fissuras e os canais. Então, a gente tem o osso frontal, o osso maxilar, o osso zigomático, o estenoide, o lacrimal, o etimoide, que tem a lâmina papirácea, e o processo orbitar do osso palatino, que é esse osso pequenininho que fica bem ali no meio. Um, e basicamente, como a gente é o serviço de residência, a gente sempre tem que lembrar, que tem que ensinar os residentes um modo mais fácil de lembrar desses ossos e como faz para diferenciar da parede lateral, da cavidade nasal. Então, a regra mnemônica para lembrar é palatino fez não. Aí você lembra dos ossos da órbita e consegue identificar todos os ossos que compõem o cone orbitário de maneira bem fácil e rápida de lembrar. Tá? Afinal, todo mundo já fez prova do título, ele sabe o quão importante é ir bem nesses, nessas provas. E aí, para identificar a fissura orbitária superior, a fissura orbitária inferior e o canal ótico, você tem que lembrar os ossos. Então, basicamente, a fissura orbitária superior ela está entre o asa menor e a asa maior do osso senoide, tá? A fissura orbitária inferior está entre a asa maior do senoide, do osso senoidal e o osso maxilar e o canal ótico está lá no osso senoide. Então, vamos lá. Vamos picadinho para vocês entenderem as estruturas. Então, o canal ótico, a gente tem basicamente o nervo ótico e a artéria oftálmica. Tá? A artéria oftálmica é a ramo da artéria carótida interna. A gente tem na fissura orbitária inferior o ramo zigomático do trigêmeo, a veia oftálmica, o ramo inferior dela, que o ramo superior vai passar lá na fissura orbitária superior, é bem fácil de lembrar pelo nome. E aí você tem artéria, nervo e veia infraorbitária também passando na fissura orbitária inferior. Na fissura orbitária superior, a gente tem os pares cranianos, o terceiro, o quarto e o sexto, ramo do V1, que é o naso ciliar, o frontal, o lacrimal, o ramo, a ramo superior da veia que é as fibras parasimpáticas do plexo cavernoso. Assim, para deixar um, um pouco mais detalhado e para ir um pouco mais a fundo sobre o tema, eu gosto de chamar que isso é a anatomia basicamente do apex orbitário. E aí... O legal é ver que a artéria oftálmica, quando ela entra no canal ótico, ela pode entrar também no, na fissura orbitária superior, mas geralmente ela entra, ela atravessa o seu cavernoso e ela entra ali no canal ótico junto com, junto com o nervo ótico, a artéria oftálmica. E geralmente ela está lateralmente ao nervo dentro do forame e inferiormente. Então, lateral inferiormente ao nervo dentro do canal. Quando a gente olha para a fissura orbitária inferior, a gente vê o ramo do, do, do zigomático, do trigêmeo, lá embaixo. Em cima da fissura a gente vê a veia oftálmica, o ramo inferior, porque basicamente vai ter o ramo superior que vai um pouquinho mais para cima, então pensa que tem que estar junto. E os três, uh, o tronquinho do infraorbitário, então tem o nervo, a artéria e a veia. Tá? E já na fissura orbitária superior, a gente tem basicamente uma fissura dividida em duas. A gente pode dividir daticamente em a parte medial e a parte lateral. Na parte lateral a gente tem os ramos do V1, tá? o lacrimal e o frontal. Uh, veio oftalmica o ramo superior e o troclear. E no ramo, na, na parte medial desse, dessa fissura, a gente tem o abducente, que é o sexto par, os, o, as duas divisões do nervóculo motor e o naso ciliar. Tá? E a gente tem os músculos. Então, a gente tem o reto medial, o superior, o lateral e o inferior, e o oblíquo superior. Tá? E cada nervo, obviamente, ele inerva um músculo ali na órbita e tem uma função. Então, Lembrar que o óculo motor é o reto superior, o inferior e o medial. O abducente, ele inerva o reto lateral. Então, os pacientes que têm, por exemplo, uma complicação de uma rinocinusite, têm paralisia do abducente, que é o nervo que passa ali no, no meio do seio cavernoso, ele teria a paralisia desse músculo. Então, ele teria um estrabismo convergente. Lembrar sempre disso. E o troclear, ele vai inervar o oblíquo. Ah, então a gente usa esse conhecimento que a gente tinha basicamente para fazer descompressão orbitária. A gente usava os limites 
na cavidade nasal que a gente conhecia e fazia a cirurgia. Então, basicamente, a gente entrava no nariz, fazia uma full fast, removia a papirácea, identificava a periórbita, fazia os limites anterior, posterior, superior e inferior, e aí com uma lâmina de 12 bem fininha, a gente abria a periórbita e expunha a gordura. Aí, dependendo de o quanto você queria uh, expor gordura ou diminuir a exoftalmia do paciente, então você expunha mais ou menos gordura. Então, basicamente, a gente fazia a cirurgia assim, né? E a gente podia também usar esse conhecimento que a gente tinha da órbita para drenar abscessos. Então, a gente podia uh, palpar a órbita, é, que nem Se quiserem abrir o microfone um pouquinho para a gente conversar, Sim. daí eu já A gente drenava o abscesso inferior e depois a gente procurava o abscesso superior. Mas o problema que eu acho nesses conhecimentos que a gente tinha é que havia uma dissociação é, de, de estudo que a gente fazia de anatomia com a, com a disposição que a gente encontrava durante a cirurgia. Né? Afinal, a gente entrava com a ótica, a gente não via as coisas de frente, né? a gente via as coisas lateralmente. Eu acho que. O, acho que e isso aconteceu muito nas cirurgias endoscópicas no comecinho, quando o Messer Klinger e o, o Stamberger faziam aqueles, aqueles guias de o que identificar no nariz. Eu acho que a gente estava começando a ter, no começo dos anos 2000, essa dificuldade. Eu acho que o Blyer ele fez um artigo muito interessante que ele compartimentalizou a anatomia da órbita. E eu gosto de apresentar isso sempre, principalmente nos cursos de OCP, esse, 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 essa figura que ele, ele, ele publicou no artigo, acho que é muito interessante a gente aprender e compartimentalizar o, a região que é importante, a região que não se deve mexer, a região menos importante, que é mais tranquila, de a gente não ter, causar nenhuma lesão na órbita. Então a gente vai lá, basicamente na cirurgia, remove a papirácea tá? e vai cair em gordura. Tirando a gordura, a gente basicamente cai no músculo, o reto medial. E o reto medial a gente pode, é, geralmente, colocar ele para cima e aí a gente vai ver as estruturas que estão atrás da órbita. Tá? A gente pode dividir o plano em basicamente A, B e C. Então, o A é um plano que não tem muita estrutura, o B é um plano que, é um plano que tem alguns vasos e estruturas nervosas e o C é um plano que não deve se mexer porque, afinal, tem, as estruturas estão muito perto e elas estão basicamente naquela região do ano nudzinho. Então, Identificando as estruturas, a gente tem o nervo naso ciliar, que é esse nervo que corre ao longo da artéria oftálmica, junto com a etimoidal anterior e a etimoidal posterior. A gente tem o nervo óptico, que é um nervo bem, bem espesso e, e passa no, bem no meio da, do, do cono orbitário. E a gente tem o óculo motor, que geralmente é dificilmente visto durante as excepções, e ele acompanha o nervo óptico. Tá? A artéria oftálmica, que eu falei, ela é ramo da artéria carótida interna, ela entra pela, na, no cone orbitário pela, pelo canal óptico e aí ela vai cruzar uh, o nervo óptico e geralmente ela cruza o nervo óptico por cima, esse é o tipo 1, que é 90 e poucos por cento dos casos, ela pode ser inferior ao nervo óptico, mas no final ela vai sempre emitir esses ramos da artéria etimoidal anterior e posterior, podendo ter alguns ramos etimoidais médios. E aí lembrar que quando você puxa para cima, você vai tentar identificar um ramo da artéria oftalmica que é o é inferomedial. E o inferomedial, na verdade, ele vai mostrar para a gente qual que é o limite dessa área AB para C, onde a gente não deve entrar. Afinal, que nem eu já falei, as estruturas vão estar muito próximas. Tá? E essa fotinho aqui na direita, ela mostra o óculo motor ali na seta escura e na foto branca ela mostra o ramo do IMT, o ramo inferomedial. E aí vocês podem ver que atrás dessa artéria não é para a gente mexer, da, da, daí para frente. As artérias anteriores e posterior etimoidal, tá, que vão cruzar o nariz. E aí é sempre legal lembrar que para identificar essa artéria na tomografia, a gente sempre tem que achar esse bico. E esse biquinho a gente acha na altura onde, uh, na tomografia, onde a gente vai uh, percorrendo a tomografia e consegue identificar os músculos uh, reto medial e o oblíquo superior. E aí vocês vão ver esse biquinho, e esse biquinho é o lugar que a gente geralmente consegue encontrar a artéria que é super importante a gente fazer antes da cirurgia, né? como o safe checklist, para você não encontrar a artéria no meio da dissecção. E aí, tentando juntar isso com o conhecimento que a gente tem de tomografia, é, para finalizar, eu acho que é super importante a gente entender que esse é um compartimento medial da órbita. A gente tem a parte medial, a gente tem a parte lateral, a gente tem superior e inferior, a gente tem que identificar os músculos na tomografia, tentar identificar o nervo óptico, a artéria etimoidal anterior, a veia oftálmica, que também às vezes dá para ver, e geralmente ela tem engurgitada nos casos de complicação, 
de trombose do seu cavernoso, ele também dá para localizar lá na tomografia, principalmente numa fase pós-contraste. Os nervos, que é dificilmente visualizável numa tomografia, e geralmente a artéria oftálmica, que dá para ver quando você aplica contraste. Tá? Então, eu acho que o ideal é a gente sempre juntar o conhecimento e tentar associar as coisas que a gente aprende na anatomia, que a gente aprendia antigamente, e agora com os conhecimentos mais diferentes, com uma visão um pouco diferente, para tentar entender a visão endoscópica da órbita. Eu espero que essa aula básica de introdução de anatomia da órbita tenha ajudado vocês a entender um pouco melhor a aula dele e espero que vocês, se tiver algum residente de fora do serviço, consiga participar do nosso curso de dissecção que acontece todo ano, que envolve aulas do Makoto, do Rodrigão, as minhas aulas do Elson, são super bacanas. Tá bom? Agora eu vou apresentar o Dr. Blair e vou mudar a chave para o inglês. Tá bom? Uh, qualquer dúvida, depois a gente pode conversar na aula. Um, I'm going to stop here. So, I'll uh, present Dr. Blair. Um, he's an associate professor of laryngology in Harvard Medical School and a mass signer infirmary at Boston. Dr. Blair is a director of the translational research in endoscopic school based surgery and co director of the Center of Thyroid Eye Disease and Orbital Surgery. Dr. Blair is also our R1 funded surgeon scientist with 10 patents and over 150 peer reviewed articles, book chapters, and textbooks. He lectures internationally and on endoscopic management of orbital and school based tumors, as well as intranasal drug delivery to the brain. His works has been featured in Boston Magazine, Harvard Medicine Magazine, and Scientist Magazine. Good morning, Dr. Blair. It's an honor having you here. Uh, you are a, such a great guy, one of the most skills, uh, skillful surgeons that I know, and one of the best researchers that I know of. Thank <laughs> you for being here, and uh, you can now share your screen and start. Thank you very okay. much for being here. Uh, well, thank you, Luciano. So I'm sharing my screen. Can you see the, the title slide there? Yes. Uh, okay. But I think you'll have to... Uh, uh, go out of the, uh, you have to just present instead of uh, going to the, um, uh, just play, just play. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So, uh, so again, thank you, Luciano, for inviting me. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, Luciano spent some time with us many years ago, along with Dr. Miyaki, and it was a fantastic time. Very, very productive. Actually, many of the slides you'll see Luciano contributed to directly. And so, uh, you know, as well as some of the papers. So it's, it's a real honor to be uh, speaking with you. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting two lectures today. The first will be on advances in endoscopic orbital surgery. And then at the end, we'll talk uh, a little bit about our re more recent work with COVID. And I know for you guys in Brazil, this is uh, as present a problem as it is for us in the United States. Um, now, this, the COVID presentation is very similar to one I gave to the Brazilian Rhinologic Society. So for those of you who've already seen it, <laughs> that gives you the opportunity to uh, log off early if you'd like. Um, so here are my disclosures. And uh, Luciana, so you can see full slide now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, very good. So, um, you know, the first thing I want to do is sort of go back historically and look at where all of the work in endoscopic orbital surgery really evolved from. And endoscopic surgery of the sinuses was first introduced in the 1980s, as we know, by folks like Dr. David Kennedy and Stamberger. And interestingly, within only a few years, there were already reports of endoscopic transnasal pituitary approaches and what we would call endoscopic periorbital surgery. These are things like orbital decompression and DCR done endoscopically. Now, as we know, in the 2000s, endoscopic skull-based surgery really dramatically expanded uh, societies were developed. Many, many papers came out about uh, both uh, the technical capabilities as well as eventually the, um, the, the efficacy and the survival rates with cancer surgery. Uh, but on the orbital side, there was not really a systematic uh, effort to develop and uh, proliferate the endoscopic intraorbital approaches really until the last decade where um, interest grew and centers like ourselves and others began to really explore the various um, aspects of endoscopic orbital surgery to really understand the endoscopic anatomy, as you saw from Dr. Gregorio. And, um, and you know, we can break this down into sort of the extra and intraconal surgical aspects, as well as the tones or the transorbital neuroendoscopic surgical approaches. 
I won't talk much about tones today, but suffice it to say that now we really have elaborated these techniques and uh, the, the growth of this aspect is starting to be where skull base surgery was about a decade ago. So that's great to see. So starting with the intracranial anatomy, I think uh, Luciano gave you a really excellent overview and I don't speak Portuguese, but I was able to pick up a little bit there. Um, but again, I think that to sort of simplify a very complex area, when we're looking from the medial aspect at the um, orbital apex, and this is the a view of the left orbit, we can see that there are, there are many structures, but there are only several structures which we really want to pay close attention to. And those structures are the optic nerve, the ophthalmic artery, specifically this takeoff of the ophthalmic artery called the inframedial muscular trunk, which supplies the medial and inferior rectus muscles, and then the inferior division of the oculomotor nerve, which supplies the medial rectus, the inferior rectus, and then this branch, which goes from medial to lateral to supply the inferior oblique. This is a cadaveric view, again, of the left orbit, where you can see those structures. So here's the oculomotor nerve as we're reflecting the medial rectus superiorly, and here's that oculomotor trunk. And then this is an intraoperative view where you can actually see these branches of the ophthalmic artery traversing from lateral to medial through your operative field. And again, this is why that compartmental approach becomes important because if you interrupt or disrupt these vascular inputs to the muscle, then you can cause postoperative muscle dysfunction and diplopia through infarction. And so you really wanna know where those vessels are and respect them. The other aspect of the anatomy which we want to pay uh, more particular attention to is the osteology. And so we all know sort of the general anatomy of the sphenoid bone and the palatine bone, but the orbital process of the palatine bone seen here is, becomes particularly important. You know, this is one of those seven bones that make up the orbital apex, the orbit proper, but specifically in this case, the orbital apex. And removal of this bone, it becomes very important for orbital apical lesions because it gives you an extra half a cubic centimeter of dissection, particularly in that infralateral vector. And so that's a bone that we, in addition to your traditional uh, removal of lamina papyracea, we want to uh, pay attention to that for removal. Also, I would say removing that bone is also very nice when you're doing orbital apex decompressions for compressive optic neuropathy, where you can actually spare some of the anterior orbit, but get a much more robust orbital apex decompression. Now, when we put these uh, arterial relationships and compartmental relationships together, this allowed us to create a staging system uh, that took into account all of these anatomic features and essentially said, based on the location of a tumor, in this case, specifically cavernous hemangiomas, based on the location of that tumor relative to these other structures, how technically complex is the surgery and what is the potential morbidity? And so we developed this, <clears throat> what we call cheer staging system. And this system was developed in collaboration with multiple international uh, experts in the field. And as we go from stage one through stage 5B, we go from least complex and least morbid to most technically complex and most morbid. And so let's just walk through that staging system. So the first stage are lesions that are extraconal, and this is outside of the muscle cone. So really lesions that are embedded in the extraconal fat. And so even though there's some dissection to be done, you're not involving some of those critical neurovascular structures that we'll see in a moment. As we head into stage two, and by the way, down here, you'll see uh, radiologic examples of all these. So as we head into stage two, this is where the compartmental approach comes into play. So again, we identify and localize that inframedial muscular trunk takeoff. And then we say that lesions that are anterior to this are generally safer, and lesions that are inferior to an imaginary line drawn across the medial rectus similarly are safer to resect because they're further away from the ethmoidal vasculature. And so stage two lesions are these anterior inferior lesions. Stage three are lesions that are still anterior to the inframedial muscular trunk, so in this sort of compartment B, but superior. And the other issue here is that often you have to retract the medial rectus inferiorly away from the ethmoidal vessels to get to that, so that can be more complex. Stage 4A now are lesions that are posterior to that inframedial muscular trunk that are really nestled between the optic nerve and the ocular motor nerve. Um, and so for obvious reasons uh, have higher potential morbidity. Stage 5B are then lesions which then start to progress into the optic canal itself. Uh, and then we're getting into lesions that extend outside of the orbit at proper. And so 5A lesions are those that extend into the pterygopalatine fossa and infratemporal fossa. 
And then finally, 5B lesions are lesions that extend intracranially. And most commonly, this occurs with expansion of that superior orbital fissure that Dr. Uh, Gregorio was talking about. So again, generally speaking, as we go from increased morbidity and increased complexity, we go from stage one up through stage 5B. So having that background of anatomy and staging, now we can start to talk more about the nuts and bolts of getting these patients worked up and into our operating rooms. And imaging clearly is a very important feature of this. And we always will get a CT scan in order to identify the bony anatomy, just like we would for any skull base or sinus case. But the MRI also becomes very important because this allows us not only to localize the lesion, but also based on the patterns of uh, gadolinium uptake and washout, we can start to develop a sense of what the pathology might be. And so these are just examples here of a lesion within the optic canal, orbital apex, and an extraconal lesion. But also we can see lesions that are not amenable to endoscopic resection. This is a metastatic lesion that's widely um, involving the orbit. Uh, but maybe, for example, we could just take this for a biopsy. Now, the other thing, and this is work that Dr. Gregorio directly contributed to, is this idea of 3D reconstruction. And so when we're in the orbital apex, we understand that not only are there neurovascular structures that are very tightly opposed within submillimeter spaces, but they're also progressing in oblique angles to any of our triplanar imaging. And so sometimes it's difficult to really understand the relationship of the tumor to the optic nerve. So here's an MRI and a CT scan showing this lesion, but it's really only when we superimpose it with the 3D reconstruction that we can see that the tumor sits above and to some extent straddles both medial and lateral to the course of the optic nerve. And so in some cases that reconstruction using commercially available software is quite helpful for planning. Another strategy we can use to identify the location of the tumor relative to the optic nerve is to use this on FOSS reconstructive imaging. So this is an MRI scan where the plane of reconstruction has been turned so that the optic nerve becomes the center and is on FOSS in every coronal cut. And so what that allows us to do is that even though the optic nerve travels obliquely through the orbit, here we can actually look in every cut from anterior to posterior, the relationship between the tumor and the nerve to determine whether there are any areas where we may be concerned that we wouldn't be able to access this from an endoscopic approach. The other question comes up whether and when to do angiography. And typically we don't use angiography. However, just as a cautionary tale, this was a patient who presented with this enhancing lesion in the optic canal. So this would be a, considered a five, excuse me, a 4B shear stage lesion. But when we looked at this, we thought this was a little superior and a little lateral to the nerve itself and didn't feel comfortable that we could access this adequately purely endoscopically. So this is one that we handed back to our neurosurgical colleagues, and lo and behold, when they did their dissection, what they found was a dolicoectatic aneurysm of the ophthalmic artery. So in this case, the aneurysm was mimicking an enhancing vascular lesion of the orbital apex and optic canal. And so in these cases, we do tend to get angiography to further characterize those lesions as they extend beyond the orbit proper. Now, then the question becomes, who is a, a candidate for a purely endoscopic resection? And historically, this really was patients who had lesions that were strictly medial to the optic nerve, um, as seen here. And for example, this is a patient who had one lesion that was lateral to the nerve and one lesion that was medial to the nerve. However, and again, this was a video that, uh, that Luciano put together, we understood that when we are doing these approaches through both nostrils, we are actually uh, taking advantage of this trajectory from the contralateral nostril to the contralateral orbit. And so we can sneak under this plane, what we call this plane of resectability. And we can actually access lesions that extend laterally into the orbit without having to pull or retract on the optic nerve. And so in fact, what we've found is we've expanded the indications of who's an endoscopic candidate, not only to patients with a lesion medial to the optic nerve, but lesions that are lateral to the optic nerve as long as they are inferior to this plane of resectability. So these patients with lesions up here and up here are still contraindicated for a purely endoscopic approach, but it really allows us to take advantage of our unique angulation as we go from both nostrils. And so these are three examples of patients all with cavernous hemangiomas, all with significant extent lateral to the optic nerve, in fact, in many cases, touching the lateral orbit which we are able to achieve a 100% total resection purely endoscopically because all of these lesions still were below the plane of resectability. 
Now, as far as the room setup, we really are derived our endoscopic approaches directly from our experience with endoscopic skull-based surgery. And so you can see here, this is me and my, uh, the time my fellow Dr. Skangas, who's now on faculty with us, operating cross table with two monitors, in fact, three monitors and image guidance. And this allows us to use up three to five hands during these dissections, just as we would for an endoscopic skull-based procedure. And then here's a, a picture of Suzanne Freitag, who's my oculoplastics partner, where we're doing a combined transorbital transnasal approach. And you can see that we can fit all the surgeons around the table still using our image guidance and imaging. And these uh, really allow us to get multiple surgeons in, which is really absolutely necessary in order to get adequate visualization and preserve all those careful neurovascular structures. One of the questions comes up is to how do we uh, optimally deal with and retract the medial rectus? And there are many different ways that have been reported in the literature. Um, things like placing vessel loops either anteriorly or endoscopically, looping them through the septum or through the nasopharynx. But we prefer to use more dynamic retraction where we place um, probes or instruments or, um, or other retractors and only move the medial rectus as we need to. And this is important to remember because all these neurovascular structures insert within one to one and a half centimeters of the uh, orbital apex or the sphenoid face. And so if you put tonic traction on the medial rectus, you can inadvertently damage either the nerve supply or the vascular supply. So it's important to allow that muscle to rest and really only retract it when and where you need to. <clears throat> the next question comes up as to when and how to reconstruct the orbit after endoscopic approaches. And there are many groups who, who advocate for no reconstruction at all. Now, I would say that when you have these large lesions with significant di um, intraconal dissection, you lose a lot of orbital volume. And this is an example post-op where you can see a lot of spillage of the medial rectus, inferior rectus into the nose. And what that leads to is this enophthalmos, which actually just from the vectorial change of the muscle can lead to diplopia. And so we do advocate upfront reconstruction, but then the, the next question is how do you reconstruct the orbit in a way that doesn't put the patient at risk for a compartment syndrome because of swelling and blood transudation? And this is an example after reconstruction. And so the solution that we've uh, advocated for is uh, actually the use of a nasoceptal flap. And the first thing about the flap is oftentimes if you're doing a binarial approach, you need a transeptal window anyway. So you can harvest that flap at the beginning of the procedure, preserve its vascular supply, tuck it away in the nasopharynx, and then at the end of the procedure, use that to reconstruct the orbit. From a size standpoint, we've demonstrated that a single nasoceptal flap can actually reconstruct the entire medial orbit and inferior orbit if necessary. But more importantly, what happens here is the flap allows you to have a soft reconstruction that still allows some blood egress from the orbit as it's healing. But over time, as we know just from our experience with skull base, the flap contracts and creates this semi-rigid trampoline-like reconstruction which recapitulates the orbital volume and prevents some of that spillage of orbital fat and loss of orbital volume and some of the cosmetic aspects that come with that. Now, in some cases, we don't just do a purely endoscopic approach. Sometimes we actually will combine an endoscopic with a transorbital or a more, most typically a transcaruncular approach. And these are indicated for lesions that are, have significant superior and lateral extent and also lesions that extend anterior next to the globe itself, because endoscopically, it's very difficult to access those. And so for those, we use either a pre or transcaruncular approach, which basically enters the bone at the posterior aspect of the lacrimal fossa, and then dissects along the lamina to gain access. And this is just an example of that. Now, in this case, we're just doing a, a transcaruncular approach for a, um, for uh, an anterior ethmoid artery ligation, but it shows you how the nice access that you can get to the medial orbit, and there's no scarring, there's really no closure that's necessary here because this is all done uh, through this um, really minimally invasive approach. And so we'll take, we'll use that in, in a lot of cases, also most commonly in non-cavernous hemangioma lesions because they tend to be more adherent. So what I want to do is take you through two examples of non-cavernous hemangioma lesions where we did a combined endoscopic and transcaruncular um, approach, just so you can see where we're going. And then we're going to show several examples of, through the cheer classification of purely endoscopic resections of cavernous hemangiomas. So this was an unfortunate uh, eight-year-old boy who presented with rapid 
proptosis, as you can see here. Um, and this uh, boy underwent imaging and basically was found to have a very large intraconal schwannoma. And so we went ahead and did a, as I mentioned, a combined endoscopic and trans uh, caruncular resection, because again, it's very difficult to access this anterior aspect of the lesion from a purely endoscopic approach. But what we do here, this is now looking in the right side, is we do a wide uh, sinus surgery, complete sinus surgery. We start with doing our bone work. And because these lesions are so large, uh, we really have to remove the entire lamina. Now, in the, some of the future cases, I'll explain how in, we can preserve lamina when it's judicious. But in this case, the lesion really took up the entire medial orbital wall. And so we had to uh, remove almost the entire lamina. The next step is to incise the periorbita. And what you'll see here is that it's, the periorbita is very adherent to the underlying extraconal fat, and it's very difficult to even identify the medial rectus muscle. Uh, and again, I want you to pay attention to how uh, sticky and desmoplastic this is, because you'll see how this differs from some of the other lesions and, and how that impacts um, you know, the types of lesions that you want to tackle endoscopically and sort of the experience you want to gain. But here we take a lot of time dissecting this lesion off of the medial rectus muscle. So here we're in the superior compartment. We're pulling that medial rectus muscle inferiorly. We're using a saline soaked neuropathy to try to keep developing that plane between, in this case, the medial rectus, and then now we're gonna go posterior and then eventually superior to develop a plane between the lesion and the um, superior oblique muscle. And so again, you can see that with blunt dissection, there is not a nice clean plane that's developing here. We have to really spend this time doing the dissection, but importantly, we have to be very careful to identify and preserve all of those neurovascular structures because the whole goal of this surgery is to preserve, diplo to preserve mono uh, or binocular vision rather, prevent diplopia and prevent cosmetic issues, particularly in this young boy who could suffer from issues related to that for the rest of his life. Now here we're coming from that transcroncular approach and we're gonna deliver that anterior lateral aspect of the tumor into the nose, as you see here. And then because these are, this is a large lesion and this is a benign schwannoma, what we're gonna do is actually debulk the interior of the schwannoma to try to collapse that, um, that uh, capsule to really enhance our ability to get a complete resection. Now in this particular case, there are actually areas of the tumor that were directly infiltrating the medial rectus and superior oblique muscle, which we purposely left behind because we didn't wanna damage vision. And so here we're taking out that last bit of the capsule there. And, and um, uh, what you'll see now is actually the view of that empty cavity with light coming in right there from the transcaruncular approach and, um, and taking out the rest of that tumor. Now, in this case, because this is a pediatric patient who's going to continue to grow, we actually didn't use a uh, septal flap. We just used gel foam reconstruction. And this is his one-year uh, post-op where you can see um, endoscopically things have healed beautifully. There's really uh, excellent um, mucosal healing and no scarring. You can actually see that the ethmoids remain patent despite just using gel film. And then here we can see that his extraocular function is perfectly intact. Um, we see no problems with, uh, with, let me just get this video to play a little bit better, with uh, double vision or enophthalmos. So this is the patient, uh, again, preoperatively with significant exophthalmos, and then one year postoperatively, where we have excellent preservation of cosmesis and uh, no diplopia whatsoever. Um, now, a similar lesion, which is uh, also very adherent and uh, causes a lot of fibrosis, are the solitary fibrous tumors. And so this is a woman who presented, again, with uh, lot less rapid onset, so that she had had progressive exophthalmos over uh, probably six to nine months before she saw us. And what we saw here was a massive tumor within the left orbit, and you can certainly see that on her exam. But similarly, because of, of the location of this tumor, because we were worried about it, potential adherence and how anterior it extended, we elected to do this with a combined approach. Again, you can see how it's really abutting the globe here. And so we're gonna take a very similar approach where we're going to start with a complete endoscopic sinus surgery on the left side, really completely skeletonize the skull base and the, and the orbit. And now here we're gonna incise the periorbita. And you can see a very different situation here where the, uh, the extraconal fat is much softer, much more in its native type of position. Here we're identifying the medial rectus and we can see how pushed medially it is by the tumor. 
Again, we're going to use our neuropathy and three to four handed dissection techniques to try to identify that lesion. And you'll start to see that here. And in this case, again, once we have that whole medial component of the tumor dissected, then we're gonna come in anteriorly and deliver this into the nose. And that's gonna help with, um, with doing our complete resection. So here we're coming in, actually we started with a lateral approach in this case, but realized again that the transcrunctia was gonna give us better access and switched over to that. And then slowly but surely, we're gonna deliver this lesion. Now you can see we're pushing and pulling quite a bit, but again, at all points, we are taking extra caution to not damage the muscle and muscle belly itself, uh, and the myofibrils, but also not to damage the neurovascular input. So over time here, we're able to dissect over that, uh, that entire uh, aspect of the tumor. We're able to deliver that and then slowly roll that tumor into the nose and as we do that, we're taking very care to we're being very careful to see any areas of adhesion. We're going to bluntly dissect with traction and counter traction because you don't just want to put direct uh, pressure on any of those neurovascular structures. So again, we're going to roll this tumor out, and um, and pretty soon here you'll see uh, almost complete delivery of the tumor. And again, you can see now we're using hands both transorbital and transnasal, and there's that final delivery there. And now you can see as this is the reconstruction. So this is our transseptal approach coming from right to left. And then we're gonna use our septal flap here to cover that tumor. So this was the scan of the patient uh, pre-resection as we saw here's the axial and coronal. And then here's the post repair where we can see a little bit of uh, spillage in the apex, but really good uh, recapitulation of orbital volume. And she wrote us a nice letter that essentially said that she had gone to five or six different centers around the country. And the only thing everyone agreed on was don't do it transnasally. So we, we thought that was a funny letter to highlight. But this is her postoperatively. Um, and so what you can see here is there is a little bit of relative enophthalmos. You can see a little bit of a super uh, lid sulcus there. But again, her extraocular function is totally intact. Her binocular vision is totally intact. And uh, she was very happy with the results. So now what I'm gonna do is switch over to uh, the second part of the lecture. So let me try to do that. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm just gonna share a different uh, lecture now. I, unfortunately, I can't fit all this on one lecture because it, it actually <laughs> is too big for PowerPoint. Um, so Luciana, can you see the full lecture still? Yeah, okay. So now we're gonna go into our specific cavernous hemangioma lesions. And again, these lesions, the reason that we differentiate these from the solitary fibrous tumors and schwannomas is because they uh, behave very differently. They have a very fibrous and discrete capsule and they tend not to invade the adjacent structures and or into, for example, the extraocular muscles. And so they're much more amenable to a purely endoscopic approach. And so what we'll do is walk through a few examples of that. So again, this is now a, a CHEER1 lesion, again, of the left orbit. And just to remind you, a CHEER1 lesion is an extraconal tumor. Now, these extraconal tumors can still be quite large, as you'll see here. Um, and in fact, sometimes it's hard to tell based on a single uh, planar image, whether it's intraconal or extraconal. But here on the axial, excuse me, on the sagittal, you'll see that the inferior rectus is draped over the tumor there. So we're going to take the same approach where we're going to take an endoscopic approach of the orbit. We're going to, in this case, be a little bit more judicious in the lamina resection. And now you're going to see where we're drilling out that orbital process of the palatine bone. So the bone removal is key because you want to get the bone out before you incise the periorbita because then you don't really wanna have an active drill in the surgical field while you're working with, uh, while extraconal fat is exposed because you don't want it to catch that. But here you can see we we're doing our, our bone removal and as soon as you have adequate bone removal, then you can proceed to your periorbital incision. And here you can tell we're coming transseptal through that large septal window. Now, the second thing is that when we make our periorbital incision for these more discrete uh, cavernous mangioma lesions, we want to really make it only one or two millimeters anterior to the lesion itself. And the reason for that is that preservation of the periorbita not only allows us to preserve orbital volume, but it also prevents extra prolapse of the extraconal fat into the surgical field. And often that's the hardest thing to deal with, which is uh, trying to retract that extra and intraconal fat as we're trying to visualize and uh, dissect the tumor. 
But here we can see the tumor blush and, and our first incision just wasn't adequate for access. So we uh, couple that with a vertical incision. And now you can see we're doing a bimanual dissection with a suction and a, and a ball probe in this case, where a third hand is holding the scope. And we're starting to expose the tumor there. And you can see how easily the structures dissect off the tumor. Now remember, this is extraconal. So all we're doing is pushing the extraconal fat and muscles away from the tumor. We're not uh, directly looking for or identifying the, that ocular motor nerve or the ophthalmic artery. But still, because there's adherence, we still want to carefully dissect 270 to 360 degrees around the, uh, the capsule itself. And once we have this tumor out, we're going to just make sure that we have all the adhesions down. You can see that 90%, if not 100% of this can be done with blunt dissection. Um, we can do a little bit of sharp dissection once the tumor is totally out of the apex, but we really, you don't want to use sharp dissection if, if, if possible. And you also want to avoid cautery at all, at almost at all costs. And so here we've removed the tumor from the contralateral nair because again, we're going transeptal. Here we can see the potential space within the orbital apex that was presented by the lesion. We irrigate that out, make sure there's no bleeding. And then what we're gonna do is patch that up. So here we're rolling the maxillary sinus mucosa back into its native position. And then here we're gonna put that nasoceptal flap over the rest of the orbit. And you can see it creates a nice uh, pocket, nice reconstruction, and it really limits post-operative crusting. So here's post up day seven, and you can see that even with just a septal flap, there's quite a bit of ecchymosis. And what that tells you is that even just the flap itself is enough to, cont to contract some blood in the orbit. And again, that speaks to this whole idea of, of kind of really staying away from upfront rigid reconstruction because of uh, the concerns over compartment syndrome. So this is the patient um, 10 months postoperatively. And um, you can see, you know, once again, we've achieved all of the sort of goals of, uh, of the care here. Let's see if it's not playing, there we go. Where you can see here extraocular function is totally intact. Um, I'm sorry, for some reason this is uh, freezing on me. But, and then again, the position of the orbits is exactly where we want it. And then when we look in the nose, we can see how that flap is nicely healed and we have a patent sphenoid sinus. Uh, so really we've achieved all those goals that we're looking for. So this is that same patient uh, in a preoperative view and postoperative view. And what you can see here is really nice positioning of that uh, nasoceptal flap with good vascularity. And you can see the symmetry of the orbits, which is exactly what we're going for with that reconstruction. So now we're gonna look at a, uh, a lesion that is in almost exactly the same location, but this is a cheer 4A because this lesion is actually intraconal, it's lateral to the medial and inferior rectus muscles. So, so roughly the same size, but in a very different location requiring a very different surgical approach. And so this is just an example of how we put our instruments in binarially. You're already used to this uh, view here. Again, this is gonna be the left orbit and we've already done our complete dissection. So now you can see we're making our very judicious sort of inverted hockey stick incision in the periorbita. But now is where we start to have a different technique. So here, we're identifying the medial rectus, and because it, we're, the lesion is a little bit lower in the apex, we're able to come in under the medial rectus to identify the lesion. Now, as we do this, you'll start to see those ophthalmic arterial branches. This is where that picture came from. So you can see those penetrating the medial rectus, and again, we want to be uh, cognizant of that. And then as we continue to dissect posteriorly, what we're going to see here is the ocular motor nerve. And again, you have to, you want to know where those structures are so you can preserve them and not damage them as a, as a part of this. Now here we're starting to see the capsule of the lesion itself. And I will tell you that when we first started doing these, among the hardest aspects of this was just finding these lesions because they can be very difficult when they're tucked away in that intraconal fat. But over time, you start to develop sort of a very, you know, set, a crisp sense of that to differentiate the fat globules from the lesion and the capsule. But it does take time and, and experience. Now, in this case, we're sort of playing with different ways to wick away fat. And I think that uh, this is one of our earlier cases where here we're using a cotton-tipped applicator. But quite frankly, these saline-soaked neuropathies I, I, are really the, the, um, the technique that I would advocate for. Because they're, they're first of all, they're able to push uh, in a broad front the fat away so you can get a good view. But simultaneously, they can wick away blood and you can suction on the patty without worrying about damaging the nerve vascular structure. So that, that's really a nice technique, whether it's a half by three patty or a half by half. Now, in this case, what we've done is a 270 degree dissection. There are still some small fibers between the lesion and the nerve, 
But what we're going to do is just gently retract in the direction of the optic nerve. So we're not putting any transverse pressure on that. And then that allows those fibers to release and to remove the tumor. Now, it's important to understand that if you're still feeling tension at that point, you should do more dissection. But at this point, it released. And then here's that septal flap reconstruction. Uh, this is what it looks like three months postoperatively. There's a little bit of granulation tissue there. But again, everything is healing pretty nicely. And then what we'll see again is that uh, extraocular function is completely preserved. And you can see there's no relative enophthalmo. So again, th this is the benefit of these approaches over historically what would have been large transorbital approaches or even craniotomy approaches. And then here is the pre and post operative views. So now we're going to go into a uh, CHEER 5B lesion. So smaller lesion, to some extent in a more uh, difficult and some, some degree more easy location because this is purely in the optic canal. And so one of the issues when we deal with optic canal lesions is that on one hand, you don't have to worry about dealing with extraconal fat and the the, uh, the approximation of the various nerve vascular structures. But on the other hand, you're right on the optic nerve and right above the ophthalmic artery. So you do have to be uh, you know, careful. The other issue here is that because this tumor is tucked away in the orbital apex, you can't really use those binarial approaches and those three to four handed approaches. So we kind of go back to our more traditional uh, you know, sinus surgical two hand approach with holding a scope and an instrument because you're really in a very narrow plane here. So we start with our traditional optic nerve decompression approach where we remove the bone over the optic canal. Here we've incised that, um, that dura or periosteum, depending on how you want to look at it. And then here there's actually this second desmoplastic layer that we're getting under in order to identify uh, the, the lesion, which is seen here. But at this point, we know that this is most likely a cavernous hemangioma. We know that it's not most likely not adherent to the nerve proper. And so we can do that same 270 degree dissection very carefully. And what you'll see here as we pull this tumor inferiorly and look laterally is we're going to see that optic nerve come into view. And we're also going to see that CSF that travels with the optic nerve kind of bathing the tumor. And so it's important to understand that you will in some respects get a small CSF leak by definition by doing these types of optic canal approaches. And then here in the same way, we're going to just gently retract that tumor. In this case, unfortunately, it sort of tore in the middle. So we had to go back for another hole, which I can tell you is not the most fun thing to do in the OR, but, <laughs> but fortunately uh, everything worked out very nicely. Uh, but here we can see we remove the tumor and then we can put that, those fascial planes back together. And then because we raised the septal flap uh, as part of our posterior septectomy approach, we can lay that back down. Um, but again, I don't think a, a vascularized flap is really necessary if, if you don't have one for these types of tumors. And here you can see that flap uh, well healed in good position uh, postoperatively. And this is what it looks like uh, endoscopically there with that flap uh, well healed. So now we're going to move to a cheer 5B lesion. So again, this is a uh, lesion that extends into the uh, middle cranial fossa. And you can see here that this is a lesion that goes through the spiroorbital fissure and actually indents the, the temporal lobe. And this was also a lesion that extends down into the pterygopalatine fossa, as you can see here. And so again, thanks to uh, Luciano for putting together this 3D reconstruction, where we can actually really look at the relationship between the tumor and the medial rectus muscle and the optic nerve. And this helps us understand when we remove the tumor also to say, did we get a complete resection? Because we can compare the final tumor morphology to what we see on the 3D reconstruction. But here we can see this patient was nicely pneumatized. So you saw there the optic nerve uh, with that arrow. And then above us here is the um, posterior ethmoid artery. And so we take the same approach. In this case, we really only need to remove the posterior half of the lamina. Um, and we can see that, that uh, this tumor is actually mostly extraconal, even though it extends intracranially. And so we can see that really intense tumor blush along the periorbita. And so our first maneuver here is going to be developing that medial plane and really re getting the tumor freed up from the periorbita and defining the difference between the periorbita and the optic canal as we head back to the annulus of Zinn. And so you'll see here, we're doing again a three to four handed approach. We're going to use a neuropathy to really define that plane. And then we'll use a, um, uh, in this case, these are actually uh, laryngoscopic scissors to incise that periorbita to free up the tumor. So now we continue our dissection. And again, we want to really just identify in a, in a mostly blunt way the uh, capsule of the tumor and separate that out from all these other uh, structures. 
And as we do in this particular case, we're going to see that there is still adherence in this case to the annulus of Zin, which you'll see in a moment by the arrow. And so again, you can't just pull, you do have to do this continuous traction, counter traction for resection. The other thing I would note is that these types of tumors, because they're in communication with both the cavernous venous plexus and the pterygopalatine venous plexus, they do have the propensity for um, moderate to significant venous bleeding after, after resection. And uh, the, so you wanna A, expect that type of bleeding and realize that it can be easily controlled with um, just very conservative measures like cold water or even warm water irrigation. Uh, you don't, again, really want to put, you definitely don't want to use co electrocautery in this location. And we really uh, don't put any type of gel, gel foam or any um, hemostatic agents either because we're worried about scarring. But here you can see there is some bleeding from the orbital apex. And so we're just going to irrigate that out in an attempt to get that bleeding uh, to stop and get under control. And eventually we do get that nicely controlled. And then here is a post-operative view after everything's healed up. Um, and uh, the patient did very well. So again, here's this preoperative MRI. And postoperative MRI is showing a complete resection of the tumor, really nice preservation of extraocular function, and, um, and again, you know, really uh, the type of outcomes that we're looking for. Now, it's not as though uh, you know, everything goes great with these surgeries, and I don't want to give you the impression that you can start doing these and not have to worry about complications or anatomy and so forth. So for that purpose, I'm going to give you a, an example of a complication that we encountered. So this was a patient with an extraconal, uh, you know, so again, a cheer one lesion, came out very nicely. We were all very happy. And um, we were headed on to our next case of the day. And we get a call from the nurse in the PACU that the patient had gotten up, went to the restroom, and all of a sudden her eyes started swelling. So luckily we had our oculoplastic team there and they came and they took uh, an extraocular pressure measurement and we were at 27 millimeters of mercury. So pretty, pretty elevated. And we said, hmm, okay. Uh, so we tried to put some surge of flow in the nose because there was some bleeding, but nothing was improving. And then the pressure started to go up to 31. And then we said, okay, let's take this patient back to the operating room. At that point, by the time we got her onto the table, again, at, just prior to intubation, her pressure was up to 50. And so uh, what we found endoscopically was significant blood clot that had accumulated, in this case, actually in the nose. This was actually medial to the flap reconstruction, which we're pulling down right here. But it, it shows you that even just some blood accumulation can be enough to put significant pressure on the orbit. But conversely, um, the fact that we knew that we had a wide open orbit, we knew what the anatomy was, we could go directly in and address this meant that we didn't have to worry about doing a lateral canthotomy or any type of other sort of urgent bedside procedure. We knew that we had about 90 minutes where we could have the eye under pressure before there was going to be any type of uh, significant long-term uh, sequelae. And that's why uh, that we had the luxury of that extra 10 or 15 minutes to get the patient back into the operating room. And ultimately, this patient did very well. So this was her uh, the next morning, a little bit of ecchymosis, but her pressures are back down to normal. And then this is her uh, post-op week one, where, where you can see quite a bit of subconjunctival hemorrhage, much more than we would typically see. And then this is um, post-operative month three. You can ignore the bandage on the nose. She had actually fallen and injured herself before this visit. But the point is, is that everything healed very nicely. So uh, in conclusion, with respect to advanced endoscopic uh, intraconal surgery, the first uh, lesson is that the, we've sort of over time realized that endoscopic candidates are not just patients who have tumors medial to the optic nerve, but they can certainly extend lateral to the optic nerve as long as they stay inferior to this plane of resectability. The second one is that the complexity and potential morbidity increases with cheer stage where Infer inferior anterior lesions tend to be the easiest and it gets more difficult as you go superior and posterior. And again, these are for cavernous hemangiomas. We've demonstrated that we can tackle even other lesions endoscopically, either endoscopic assisted or entirely endoscopically, such as schwannomas and solitary fibrous tumors, but they really, they behave very differently and time will tell whether the outcomes are the same or not. Although I will tell you as of now, they do seem to be and certainly approximate, and if not better than open approaches. And then finally, and I think this may be the most important lesson, is that the team approach is absolutely critical. As I mentioned, a lot of these procedures are derived from our experience with endoscopic skull-based surgery. And really the key to that was the development of skull-based teams of ENTs and neurosurgeons who work together all the time on these lesions to develop these approaches. 
And the same is true for these orbital surgeries. So I would encourage all of you out there who are interested in doing these surgeries to really link up with your oculoplastic colleagues, make them understand that these lesions can be addressed endoscopically and that you both bring expertise and benefits to the table. And I think that's really so critical. We don't want um, ENTs alone going after these lesions because once you develop complications, you're still gonna need them to help you. So it's really important to have them on board. And certainly the orbital cavernous mangiomas are the ideal lesion to start with. But, um, but as we've demonstrated, once you gain that experience, you can start to expand your indications. And so um, I just want to draw your attention to the, this is uh, Suzanne Freitag, my partner in all this. And um, we did recently, actually, well, not so recently now, a couple of years ago, publish this book with, through Time. Oh, I do get royalties from this, although not much. But the point is, is that this really covers um, in detail the, all, everything we've discussed and more with regard to concepts. So again, if you're really interested in this um, type of work, I would encourage you to have a look at that textbook if possible. So I think I'm gonna stop here. I'll stop sharing my screen for this lecture. And then do we wanna take some questions before we move on to the COVID work? Yes, um, if anyone have questions, could uh, just uh, write in Portuguese or open your mic and ask in English to Dr. Blair. So I have a personal questions. Um, first question, uh, if you had a bleeding uh, intracorally, we know that uh, applying heat inside your orbit could be the very sick could cause a lot of sequelae. How do you manage orbital bleeding during surgery? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. I think what we have to remember is that when we think about bleeding, first of all, we want to think about pr primary prevention of bleeding. And, I, and all, everything we've talked about has, has spoken to how you avoid bleeding by understanding the anatomy. But even if you have a bleed, um, you have to remember that these arteries and arterioles are very, very small, and they will tend to spasm and, and clot on their own if you just have given enough patience. We, we are working in an open orbit, so the concern about an, an immediate orbital compartment syndrome is much lower because the blood is able to egress into the nose. So the key is the, is the lack of doing something. Again, I would irrigate with warm water. You can go up to 40 degrees centigrade and irrigate the orbit with that and just give it time. What I would not do is try to chase down the bleeder. I would not try to get into the orbit with certainly monopolar cautery, but even bipolar, you're much more likely to cause damage than you are just by being patient. Again, you have the benefit that you have a big open exposure in these cases. And so you have all the time in the world to just let the blood clot on its own and then postoperatively, you may not, you may choose not to reconstruct. You may just want to let that egress and do a planned reconstruction later. But, um, but you know, the, sometimes the hardest thing to do is do nothing. All right. Like anyone have questions for Dr. Blair? Alguém tem perguntas para ele em português? Eu posso fazer em inglês? Professor, can I ask a question, Luciano? Yes, of course. Oh, thank you, Professor. Uh, do you have to use some kind of uh, nerve monitoring during these this surgeries? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I, right now, there really isn't a good nerve monitor um, that exists that we use routinely. I think in the future, there are a couple of things we would like to see. And these, you know, from an innovation standpoint, this is wide open. And so the couple of things that we would be interested in would be monitoring, you know, the extraocular muscles, but most importantly, we would want to be monitoring the pupil and the ciliary nerves and the optic nerve itself. So there, we know that you can use visual evoked potentials as a, as a way to understand whether the optic nerve is under stress. And the ciliary nerves contribute to the pupillary shape and contraction and dilation. And in fact, and this is something that the oculoplastic surgeons know very well, if you put too much pressure on the uh, ciliary nerves, then the pupil will actually start to distort during the procedure. And so the ability to monitor that in real time would be very beneficial. We don't have that ability right now, but we've spoken with different groups to see if that's you know, something that could be developed. Maybe somewhere, someone uh, listening now has some expertise that could do that. So it's an unmet need is what I would say, but it would be very helpful. Okay. And I, I like very much the, the use of the nasoceptal flap for the reconstruction. It's, it's great. Uh, do you think that the, the retraction of the, the flap could increase the orbital uh, pressure, intraorbital pressure to, I think, I mean, to, to cause a compartmental syndrome? Yeah. 
So I think the, the contraction, no, because the contraction happens, you know, within four to six weeks um, and may, you know, maybe as early as two to three weeks. But by then the orbit is, the swelling has gone down, the bleeding has stopped, the fluid has stopped transudating. So the time frame is not enough to cause that. But on the other hand, what's surprising is that, as, and you saw a couple of those examples, is that just putting the flap there still traps some blood in the orbit relative to nothing. So you still have to be somewhat careful. But when we see other groups who are describing putting you know, titanium mesh after these approaches or cartilage in the medial orbit, I, you know, I really strongly worry about that um, just because you, know, you might get away with it eight out of 10 times, but those times you don't, you're gonna regret it. <laughs> Okay. All right. Do, do you ever ever do, do you have ever seen uh, the nasal septal uh, artery um, suffering because you rotate all the way this the nasal septal flap right like 180 yeah. to the orbit. But I think it's too, uh, very strong. But like still, like have you ever been uh, had uh, suffering on the nasal septal flap or something like that. Yeah, it's a good question. So I, so I would say two things. One is no, we, we, I've never seen a nasoceptal flap uh, infarct, which is you know, impressive given the number of flaps that we use. On the other hand, it is a great point that you are rotating um, the flap, although you're not under significant tension, but you could also consider um, raising the flap from the contralateral side if you needed to, and then run it across and around. Now you lose a lot of length to do that, but it does preserve the tract of the artery. So if you're strictly doing like an apical lesion, that would be a reasonable approach if you're worried about that. All right. Makoto, have you ever another question? Anyone? I have a, one last question, sorry. Uh, okay. do, you think, do you think that the neuropathies could cause uh, some, kind, some kind of vasospasm? In ah, yeah, that's a good, very good question. And something I didn't, I didn't specify, but these neuropathies are saline soaked. So okay. unlike, unlike your, for your approach and sinus surgery, where you may soak them with adrenaline or epinephrine or cocaine, depending on what you're using, um, once you incise the periorbita, we, we remove all the patties from the field. And I use one to a thousand epinephrine and replace them with saline patties. It's the same thing we do when we do skull base. Once we cut dura, we remove all the epi from the field. So yes, uh, great question. These should be saline soaked. You should not put any adrenaline or, uh, or afrin or oxymetazine in the orbit. But I would say that at the end of the procedure, um, even in sinus surgery, where I use one of a thousand epinephrine for my approach, at the end, I still like afrin because of, the, of its longer half-life. So I still like to use Afrin at the end, but what I do is I just soak patties with Afrin and I directly apply it to the cut mucosal edges instead of just spraying it in the nose. And that helps prevent my concern about Afrin trickling into the orbit. Nice trick, thank you. Great, and uh, yeah. I, I would like to uh, pinpoint an uh, idea that you uh, just showed in the end of the uh, lecture, that is uh, having a team to help you. Um, we have a lot of uh, former fellows here uh, on, on the participant list. And I would like you to, uh, again, highlight that you work in a team, that you don't do the, the, the cases by yourself, and you always have help of, ophthalmolog of, of, of an ophthalmologist in the field, right? Right. And moreover, I would say from a research perspective, all the work I've presented has been with the help of 15 to 20 research fellows, international research fellows, Luciano, uh, you know, as, who played a very prominent role. So none of this is my work alone. And I want to make sure that that's very clear. Okay, great. I don't think I have, have, have anyone questions. Alguém tem alguma pergunta? So, um, I don't think so.